civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people. We urgently need financial, political and social innovations that enable us to overcome this structural dependency on growth. We need to change the system. This isn't cleaning up the beaches in the case of plastic a little bit faster. That's vital, that has to be done. But you need to stem the flow. Go Simon explores sustainable change and the women inspiring it. Who are they? What made them who they are? How do they read the world they live in? Our guests share their story, roots, passions and hopes for the future. They tell us more about the alternatives and strategies they developed to tackle climate change. After our first episode with Cleanne Gabriel, a researcher on degrowth and transition to a well-being economy, I thought it would be interesting to hear a woman who has chosen to embrace and live the degrowth way. Our Simon today is Hélène Grosbois. After having worked for many years in finance for Société Générale and Natixis, and then as a promoter of green finance for environmental NGOs in Brussels, Hélène is now dedicated to implementing her personal transition. Autonomous house, permaculture, she explains for us further her visions to build the society of tomorrow. With Hélène, we discussed green finance, collapsology, autonomy, COP25, life with less in a forest, tipping points and artificializations of the land. Hi, Hélène. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for talking about your journey with us. We are calling each other. You are based in France at the moment. So you grew up in the Paris region. How was it to grow there and what kind of childhood did you have? I was in the suburbs of Paris, not in the wealthy suburbs, in the poor suburbs. It was a bit gray, I would say, like uh, a bit depressing because it's not very beautiful and there's a lot of poverty there. But I was lucky because my parents were more wealthy. My father is a doctor. He's a surgeon, an ear, knees, throat doctor. And my mother is a teacher. She's a French, English, Latin German teacher. I was raised in between science and literature. I had to find my way and this is why I think I chose to study economics because I had to mm. find my own way in life. So I would describe my childhood as quiet. Most of the time I was in the cloud. I didn't have any brother or sister to play with so I was spending a lot of time with my parents. Were you free to choose the career path you decided to oh, go yes. for? Total freedom for everything, even for religion. You know, when I was 12, she told me, you haven't been baptized when you were young because we want you to choose the religion or no religion, if you want, of course. And they wanted me to think about it. Why? Why are you going to do this or that? Being raised by a teacher is always like asking questions. To find by myself the answer instead of, you know, reading newspaper, for instance. You started your career in the finance sector. Can you tell us more about those roles? I choose finance because finance is a transversal. You have to go through finance at some point and it's impacting the whole economy. So when you choose finance, actually, you don't choose a sector. I was advising member of the board because in a very big structure, like uh, like the bank I was working in, which is systemic, it's like working for a, a government of a big country. The board people, they have people working on the problems and advising them and helping them to do their job. It was very interesting mm -hmm. because those people, those members of the board, they are working fast and well. They want you to, to be better every day. So I learned so many things. I learned how is working capitalism because everybody is talking about the system all the time, but very few people know how it's working for real. How do we create money? After working for the finance sectors in Paris and Hong Kong, I believe, you transitioned mm -hmm. to an environmental NGO. What triggered the Actually, change to the green finance? When I just got my diploma, I was already thinking about the environment and I wanted to create a kind of concept star about environment. And I knew some business mm -hmm. angels and they all told me at this time, oh, Elaine, that's a great idea, but nobody cares. Nobody will go to your shop, etc., etc maybe you should do that but in 20 years 
So I was like, okay, what I'm going to do, I want to do something which is transversal. Then I went in the finance industry at different, several positions, in the end doing this strategical advisory for the board. And then I was like, what can I do now in finance? Because I have a great job and I cannot find any job that would be so interesting for me because I'm a girl and I'm not an engineer. So obviously I'm never going to be a CEO of the bank. And at the same time, I was seeing that environment was going worse. And in 2008, there was this quota carbon or CO2 quotas. So I went in many, many different conferences. And at some point, I heard the ex-CEO of WWF France, which is a bit famous in, in Europe and in France. His name Pascal Canfin. And um, he knew about finance. And I went to see him and he told me, OK, maybe you should come to WWF. Can you explain a little bit what green finance is? Green finance is, is a supposed way to make capitalism sustainable. At the beginning, I was thinking it would be like possible and mm. helpful. And after a while, yes, I realized yeah. absolutely not. What made you realize? When I saw in the figures that uh, renewable energy wouldn't help us. And then I realized, okay, plus lucky me, I went to the COP23 in Bonn, in Germany, from the, from the train station to the UN village in Bonn. So I started to talk with a girl with, who was working in laboratory about uh, agriculture. And we seated on the bus and I remember she told me that's one of the first things I heard in the COP. I was not even in the COP, actually. And she told me all the scientists and everybody at the COP knows already we're going to go far above the two degrees. We know it already right now. It was, a, <laughs> it was like a big shock for me. I've been talking with like scientists at the COP. Renewable energy needs a lot of, of different metals, loads. Mm -hmm. And those metals, mm -hmm. like you need to extract them. You need energy to extract them. So actually, like we were just postponing the problem, exporting your CO2 emission. When you're going to use the wind or solar system in your country, yes, it's not polluting, but to make it, you have been doing loads of pollution in another country. It's never going to work like that. We are just exporting the pollution in China or India. We are still artificializing the land of this planet. And the NGOs are against nuclear. And we have climate problem already. When you have all those different information at some point, you are okay yeah actually i think it's not possible to do it the supposed green way the green growth it's not gonna work it's not a question of changing the gdp the way you calculate it we need to decrease for real since working for this uh, ngo and lobbying for green finance you chose to live in a french rural area and become fully yeah. self-sufficient and autonomous can you tell us a bit more about how you live I realized that working in the green finance, I was just participating to the pollution again, like traveling, working. At some point, I need to leave the system to decrease. To me, it's the only way to decrease today. So I mean to reduce my carbon footprint. I arrived to this autonomous house. I am living in the forest. Right now, I'm not autonomous at all because like, I just arrived and it takes minimum five to 10 years to be autonomous because, for instance, you need to plant trees for the fruit and it's not going to give you fruit like from one year to another. I have been reducing everything, reducing the heat inside my home, the number of uh, showers I will take in every single week. I'm not washing everything all the time, etc. When you are living in the forest, you're not working, so you don't need to be mobile. So you reduce a lot your pollution because you are staying at home. It's a whole slowdown. Did you buy a house? I bought a old house which was already existing for two or three centuries it's a very old farm which was abandoned i bought mm. it because i did it with my mom and this is how we could buy a house because i had some spare money she also had spare money we have our own source of water which is also an important part of being autonomous Because collecting water, treating it to make it clean again, like it's, it's costly in energy. And actually, nobody's got the town water here. All the houses were built on a source. How did you choose yeah. the area? Is it because you have roots there? 
I'm from this region, but it was not uh, why I arrived here. I looked at the risk of a uh, flood. Most of the people in climate change problem will die in floods. So it's written in any report you will read about climate change. So I'm in the middle mountain. I'm 500 meters above the sea level. Then I looked at pesticides. Because if you have a land which has been used for industrial growing for decades, maybe it's going to take a long time to you to make it productive again without chemicals. Also, I wanted to be in a place where there's not too many people. Trivial question. What do you live off? In France, when you stop working, you got money from the state. Loads of money, you've got a 60% of your pre previous wage, so it's good. And if you've been working for more than two years, you're going to have two years of the 60% of your last salaries. And after that, you have another system from the state which is going to give you money. It's 500 euros. If you don't have any job, the government is going to give you 500 euros every month. Like a kind of universal mm. revenue, but it's not universal because it's for the people who don't have revenues. I'm having this for two months now. 500 euros well, when you are living in the forest, it's far more than enough. Could you describe your days? Right now, it's the period to plant trees for the fruits. So I did that last week. In a house like that, so you have lots of things to do and, you know, you do a list and every single day you write new stuff on the list and you don't go fast enough to reduce the list. I'm, I'm doing separations on, on my piece of land, like recreating separations in different areas of the land. I take dead wood and mm -hmm. I put it in different areas of the land to make the biodiversity come again. Were there some people who inspired you? How did you learn about About it and who influenced you on the ideas of degrowth, permaculture, autonomy? How did you learn? Because you're coming from a very urban background. Degrowth is just me being rational, but I heard about the collapsology trend. Collapsology mm -hmm. is not something that people talk about in this part of the world, uh, in, in Australia. Would you just remind what collapsology yeah. is? Collapsology is the idea that at some point human beings will have been using all the resources on this planet and that there will be no other issue than the collapse of the Occidental society. Because Occidental society mm -hmm. is fully based on resources, fossil fuel resources, and we are trying to shift to metal resources. But both of them are not illimited on this planet. The planet is limited. This is why the previous uh, UN uh, chief officer said there is no planet B. And then I, I mm. discovered the Meadows report, the limits to growth. And I want to mention it because if people don't know, they should look at that. It's from the 70s. Yes. It's very accurate. Yes. People in the 17s calculated exactly where we are today. One of the pushbacks that we hear frequently is that capitalism brought health and education. What do you respond to those people who can't see a future without capitalism? It's just it's like everything in life, too much of, of something is bad. Without food, you cannot live, but too much food, you die also. And it's the same for capitalism. Yeah. At some point, this system was good brought peace, brought wealth, education, etc. It's totally true. Long life, in a, in a better health, etc. But at some point, it's killing us. This year, for the first time on this planet, there have been more people suffering from obesity than starving. It shows so much that at some point, we have to stop. Yeah, capitalism was good. It's not anymore. It's because in the Occidental way of thinking, everything is very binary. You're pro or against you know, zero mm. or one. But no, there's a bit of good and bad in everything. And this is something I learned when I was living in Hong Kong, because in Asia, everybody thinks like that. There's no black or white. There's a lot of gray and there's good and bad in everything. This is the yin-yang sign. The mm. yin and yang sign mm. is the good and the bad are equal on this planet. And the little dots is the good in the bad and the bad in the good. Nature is much more complex than that. When we say like we need to degrowth, degrowth, it's not going backward. Yeah. This is a mistake everybody does because backward, we were using wood. We, we haven't hadn't found oil, gas, etc., coal, etc. And if you read Collapse of Jared Diamond, 
you will see that even uh, 3,000 years ago, there was a wood problem because everywhere human was uh, living, they would gather all the wood and at some point they, they would deforest everything and they didn't have any more resources. So they had to move. We don't have to go back because if we go back, for instance, if everybody uses uh, wood, we have a big problem. Obviously, we are not going to deforest the whole planet. It's just a question of doing something new, doing something the humanity has never ever been doing on this planet. But for instance, I think there's a lot of stuff, 80% of what we produce on this planet, which are not systemically important. I mean, for you to stay alive. Is it a problem if tomorrow L'Oreal disappears of this planet? In a future low-carbon society, do you see people all becoming autonomous? We need to define autonomous. When I, when I say autonomous, it's not in energy. Because the transition, most of the people think ecological transition, energy transition, which is a mistake. If we still use the same amount of energy, we are going to destroy the same amount of, of nature on this planet. It's very simple. We need to decrease the energy we consume. So when I say autonomous, I, I'm talking about water and food, which is also the biggest footprint on this planet. If we are deforesting, it's to make food. One of the only way not to all die in an apocalyptic planet would be to do intensive agroecology. And everybody would have a piece of land and a bit of fruits and vegetables. This is a good way to store carbon. The problem is cities are not sustainable and cities cannot be sustainable. It's totally impossible because when you are living in a city, everything is coming from very far away. And when you yeah. transport something, you burn oil, basically. In the city, you trade or you work in a systemic sector. The way you describe your transition, it seems to be quite an individualistic journey. Others are more in a community-driven dynamic. They are trying to create a local ecosystem, which involves more people, like uh, creating hubs, like eco-hubs. Is it something you will want to look into? Do you feel, or do you more subscribe to the survivalist mode? What's your views on that? Both and none at the same time. <laughs> You know, I, I'm not a survivalist. I'm a girl. Obviously, I, I will lose whatever happens. So it's not a good idea, I think. But I don't think as well that eco-villages or eco-place can work. I looked at it. I studied all these eco-places and you know most of them are failing. Why? People don't know each other. They start to live together. Obviously, it's very hard to live together even when you love the person so when you're not in love it's more complex and so they just fight and in the end they split because also i think it's not the right time now in france if you don't look at the problems you can have a normal life so there's not enough constraint for the people to accept to live with default of the yes. others but i will see how the future is evolving i'm adapting all the time actually this is what i would say And I yeah. think we will have to adapt all the time just because of climate change and the six mass extension. We're going to have to adapt every all the time. It's going to change very fast. You grew up in the system. Is it difficult sometimes and still now after having made those decisions? Do you struggle sometimes with the choice you made? The way the, the climate Is, is moving, you know, of course, I'm full of doubts. First, something I didn't see coming is that when you are living in the forest, you are seeing the forest dying. You are seeing it every single day. You see trees dying. You see you know, that animals are going in cities because they cannot find any more food. You, you see all that. You see uh, rivers, you know, drought during the summer. So you see the nature in front of your eyes dying. And this is the hardest part for me. The good side is that I'm not in the city anymore, which is like for me the, the total symbol of, uh, of the failure of our system, the city. And I don't see people consuming, I don't see the cars, I don't see all that, which was very hard for me before to see every single day. And also I have a lot of doubts because the way the climate is evolving is making me thinking that at some point we will have to grow food indoors. This is not the choice I've been doing. Now I'm planting trees that will take at least 20 years to be fully autonomous. And I'm really wondering, maybe I'm not going to have the time. 
maybe my young trees are never going to be adults. In the way you see things going, do you feel that people and leaders will wait those extremes to actually start waking up? Yes, yes, most of them, yes. It's sad, but uh, it's like it's like uh, cigarettes, tobacco. Yes. Most of the people that are smoking, they know they will have cancer, but they still do that. It's only when they have very, very bad cancer that they, they stop. I think like most of the people are like that. Do you feel your change, your personal change inspired other friends, colleagues, family around you? Yes, they do. Because they see like it's possible to, to live without working. So at the beginning, they were like, oh, la, la, she's crazy. What is she doing? Etc. Etc. Now they see that I'm still alive, that I'm well, actually, much better than when I was in the city. And they are starting to think, but maybe I'm, I'm stupid going working every single day. Look, Ellen. Because most of the people, they hate their job, actually. But they still do it because most of the people are doing it. Despite the moves you've done on a transition, but still observing that around you, most of the people don't really actually make change. Do you keep being hopeful for the future? Are you still optimistic that we'll, we'll sort out this, this climate emergency? Uh, no. Depending on what you mean with future. <laughs> no, but depending on what you mean with future. I don't think people are not acting. Why? Because we are using a vocabulary which is not accurate. We are saying that we are fight against climate change. You can fight as long as you want. Fight that the climate change is something dynamic. The earth yes, is a living okay. place which is dynamic. It's not like mm -hmm. a a photographic, like not moving at all. So also, I think that's why it's a bit like creating confusion in everybody's mind. And many people are not doing anything because they, th they think, oh my God, we cannot stop climate change. It's impossible, which is true. The question is how fast we are making the change. This is the, the real question. Do we want to take seven degrees in 100 years? Or do, you, do we want to take four? But we need to keep in mind that in a natural process, you take five degrees in five degrees in 20,000 years. And we are going to do at minimum, minimum, minimum four in 100. So the, so the change is going to be big. If the question is the future, meaning still human beings on this planet, or no human beings on this planet. The way we are acting now is de determining the future of humanity on this planet. Because at seven degrees, there's nobody on this planet. First thing we need to accept is that the population is going to degrowth, one way or another, with different pro processes, maybe at the same time, I don't know, but it's going to degrowth, which is very hard for an Occidental to accept that because we have been raised in growth, Growth of human being, growth of the economy, which is linked to growth of the human being, actually. So am I optimistic about the future? I'm optimistic about the fact that there are probably going to be human beings on this planet in one century. But the question is how much, in which conditions? But no, I'm not really optimistic because we have reached a lot of tipping points already. We need to see how to adapt. And to adapt is going to be by decreasing what you want in life. It's as simple as that. And, and with this simplicity, you find other ways to be happy. And it's much more deep. I'll touch on feminism a little bit. Have you experienced yourself sexism? And do you feel it's been a barrier to the promotion of your ideas? When I was working in the financial industry, never. I was uh, with uh, loads of men everywhere. But I never experienced sexism. So it was really nice. Now, you know, I'm kind of an activist on social networks, I would say, on LinkedIn. And yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, a lot of, a lot of sexism. And of course, it's a barrier to my ideas. When you are a girl, you are hysteric. When you are a man, you have balls. I thought it was funny how you mentioned earlier how you knew from the get-go when you started your career in finance that you would not be one of those managing the bank because you were a woman. That's what you said first. And then because... And because didn't I didn't have the right diplomas. Yeah. yeah. But woman was, was a factor. So why did you integrate that pretty much from, from the get-go? Because men, they block everything. Some of them in politics, when I was at WWF, etc., told me straightforward, 
if we don't keep a bit of power, we are going to be totally useless on this planet. You are taking everything from us. In politics, it's very uh, obvious. Guys, they prefer to make deals with opposite uh, politics parties mm -hmm. than give a, a place to women because they will make a difference. When there's a collapse or war, women are taking the power because they are the ones who are feeding the country, taking care of the kids and acting. And the guys are going to the battlefield, killing each other. I shared with you uh, before this interview two articles. The first one was an article published in Cambridge Independent called It's Time to Focus on Near-Term Collapses. And it comes back on what we touched on a little bit, which is the, the way we communicate about climate change. Mm -hmm. Do you feel at the moment the way we communicate about it is the right way? How do you think media should tackle the problem? I would say that we are way too gentle in order not to shock people. Yes. But we've seen that it's just when people are going to die that they move. So maybe they, they are, we need to be tough with them, like a kind of electroshock. You don't feel that people could enter panic mode, which would be sometimes, which is sometimes more counterproductive than, than anything? All what we've tried so far is a total failure. <laughs> for instance, a few weeks ago, the climatologists who are doing the models for the IPCC, you know, they did an update. Mm -hmm. We have been doing the more precise calculation we have been doing yeah. ever. Much, much more precise. We have been mixing up 30 different models. And the result is that as of today, there's no scenario which is going under 1.5 degrees. Have you seen that in the media? NGOs have been saying for decades, we need to be gentle. Electroshock is going to create panic, etc. This is coming from NGOs. In WWF, they told me, ah, we did study. If we tell the reality to the people, they are going to panic, etc. First, I don't think psychology is the same in every country and in every culture. Americans, they tend to be a bit childish. This is why they, the NGOs think we need to act with the people like if they are kids. I don't think people are kids. And why also NGOs don't want to tell the truth? It's because if you say, oh yes, we are going to hit two degrees, we are never going to stop climate change, etc., etc., what is their job then? They are supposed to fight against climate change and they need money from the donators. So if you tell the donators, uh, we're doomed and whatever is going to happen, uh, the, the world is going to collapse, then, you know, you stop the system, you stop donations. So they are never going to say that. We need to talk about nuclear. We need to explain that today we cannot do without nuclear. Mm. If we do that, we kill all the forest on this planet. So we need to say it. Ah, but no, it's decades. We are against nuclear. Most of our donation comes from people who are against nuclear. So we cannot say that. Okay, so don't tell the truth. Just lie to keep the system as it is. This is why I quit, because I didn't want to be part of it. COP is the exact uh, institution of the system. And all you are going to get is green growth. Do we want green growth? No, it's not working. You cannot change the system with institutions of the system. I thought it was possible, but we can see it's not. I think the last COP, non-results are proving it. Like it's um, just preserving status quo. Even when we reach agreements, like the Paris yes. one. And what no, happened nothing. after yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Another article that I shared with you was published in The Guardian on Extinction Rebellion and how they stage an air pollution protest in London and Manchester. What do you think of Extinction Rebellion, of activism on climate change and radicality? That might be a first step. That might be a way to open a door on something else for the people who are joining Extinction Rebellion. This is not an end. It's just a first step. Protest, it's a symbol. It's symbolic. We are living in a society of symbols. Mm. There's the system, uh, there's the protester, you are the citizen, you are a consumer, you are a parent. But we forget that we are just human, human beings on this planet. Protesting is a good symbol, but it's changing nothing. And then you have to change for real your life. Changing for real is growing your own food. It's normal I'm saying that, people are going to say, because this is what I'm doing. But the most powerful act you can do today is grow your own food. And this is action. And yeah. what would you recommend to someone who would like to start a transition journey? First, think that you don't need lots of money. 
You can build an autonomous house starting from 5,000 euros. So when you're going to get that, that gives you a lot of, of freedom. Do you think it's a logic which is applicable to countries where the state is not as present, as prominent as in France? That's a big problem. Like, lucky us in France, the state is very powerful. Look, uh, we, 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 it's helping the people and also the state can really change the society. In a very liberal country, like you have very, very few power and th that's a big mm -hmm. question. Also, I think in Australia, there's a lot of farms. You can learn very easily in a farm how to do it. You do that in two or three places and then you do your own places and it's going to be very easy because you have been seeing different places, you have gone getting the good ideas. Agroecology, you, you don't work the land, so you just put munch mm -hmm. on it. There's not many work actually. People imagine it's, there's loads of work, but no, it's less work. That's what the people okay. think. Before, all the people, you know, were working the land all the time, doing very mm -hmm. clean, you know, ranks of, of yeah. I don't know, carrots, mm -hmm. clean ranks or whatever. We realize it's not, you can be much more productive in re reproducing what the nature is doing. A, a mix. Nature is not mm. doing ranks. Yeah. <laughs> nature is doing mix because it's the mixity that makes the wealth of, of the soil. of the Because the nature is doing a lot yeah, for yes. you. And you are going to be much more happy in a very short period of time. You slow down. You go in bed when it's night. You wake up at five when the sun is rising. You have much more power because you are on a natural way of life. You feel much more peaceful and relaxed, I would say, also. Mm -hmm. And you give meaning. You were mentioning mm -hmm. that you were communicating a bit on LinkedIn. What for? Is it to convince more people to join the oh, transition? First, it's for sanity check, I would say, like for me. It's because I'm like that. Raising alerts is mm. who I am. What I was doing for the board in the banking industry, it was the same kind yeah. of stuff, actually. You would ask me the same question last year. I would say, oh, yes, we still can manage a bit the change, etc. Today, when I see how fast it's going I'm, I'm not sure we can manage anything but how do we adapt and this is why uh, I'm communicating about it because I think people will suffer less if they have autonomous house than if they are you know depending uh, for everything on anybody mm -hmm. else you see I think the the degrowth the decrease the decline the whatever you, the collapse or it's going to be more acceptable if you have an autonomous house than if you yeah. don't I'm talking about the autonomous house and trying to debunk the green growth, the green finance. People are talking always about waste. Okay, waste, uh, it's important. But, you know, fishes are not dying about waste in the ocean. They are dying about uh, because of overfishing and acidification. Mm -hmm. To conclude, uh, do you have a book, a film, a cultural reference you would like to recommend to our listeners, something that inspired you? There's one which is funny, is Mike Horn. The sailor? Yes. So for me, it's the, this guy, you know, he's sailing, walking, skiing, he's doing the, he has been doing the world round trip without Assistant. any, you know, uh, machine, only with men's strengths. Yeah. And also without assistance, yes. But, um, so, you know, this guy, like, uh, he's really showing that we can live in the nature that we don't need to fight against nature. I think this guy has never been thinking that he needs to work to, to live on this planet. From the very beginning, the guy thought, I'm going to go everywhere on this planet by myself and mm. live like that. It's very extreme. I, I'm not saying that everybody should be this guy. Of course not. But in between being like a small uh, rabbit in a cage in a city and this guy, maybe there's a path. Also, something that I really like and I really encourage people to read is the global history, it's scientific history. Because when you do history, most of the time you go in archives, which is absolutely not the case of the world history. World history is about gathering scientific research of the history of the planet and also history of the humanity. And this is a science which is quite new, I would say. So you study all the history of the planet and the humanity through environment. And actually, you, you see a very different story. 
of the planet and humanity. That's what we've been told and, mm -hmm. and teached mm -hmm. in school. For instance, the Roman Empire collapsed because of droughts and not because of politics or war. Or... And there's the most famous guy for world history is Alfred Crosby. I've never read out uh, his books because there's French guys using his work, compressing it. But the reference for the world history is Alfred Crosby. And it's very interesting. You understand that men since the very beginning has been using, overusing resources. And also, yes, I recommend to read the Limits to Growth report from mm. the Meadows report because mm. like everything is yeah, in the report. It was already huh? there in the city. It was the time to do sustainable yes, development. But now it's too late, sadly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for your words. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and questions on this episode. Feel free to share them with us on Go Simon's social media channels on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn or Facebook. We're always happy to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm.